Welcome back everyone to episode nine of the CPTSD podcast. We've been getting so much great feedback from you guys and a lot of questions about when can we cover particular topics and they're so good. They're so interesting. And the thing we want to say is hang tight. Complex trauma is complex, uh, which means that there's often not either a singular event or even just like maybe it was only an abusive childhood. Uh, imagine that there's a complex constellation of all the things that could make up complex trauma. So um, as you're beginning to understand um, what complex trauma means for you, keep looking online for resources, books to read, um, certainly therapy and support, and we'll keep chipping away little by little at the topics as we come to them. So you're not going to want to miss this episode because we're talking about more ways to cope with an overactive nervous system. Welcome everybody to the CPTSD podcast. I am Tabitha Bird Weaver, a licensed psychotherapist in Oregon here with my partner in crime, Beth Pace, a licensed um, professional counselor supervisor in the great state of Louisiana. And we have a special guest today here to talk with us about all things nervous system and fascia, Shelly Thomas. Shelly is a level three certified MELT instructor, which means she is highly educated in areas regarding your fascia as well as fascia relief and neurobalancing. She has studied directly with the creator of the MELT method, Sue Hitzman, and I can't wait to dig into this, Shelly, with you. Um, I'm wondering, Shelly, you know, a lot of our listeners come to us with CPTSD, and one of the things I hear from them and also from my clients and myself is that chronic pain and or autoimmune issues tend to go with CPTSD. And so I know, Shelley, that you have a history with chronic pain yourself, and that's what got you connected with Melt. Would you please tell us a little bit about that and how you ended up following this course and helping all the people you help? Absolutely. Thank you, Tabitha. And thank you, Beth, for having me today. I really appreciate this opportunity to, to share some of this knowledge with um, your folks and um, bring a little more awareness to our fascial system for sure. So I always like to say my journey to melt started about four years ago because I, as a young adult, had some chronic pain issues and really felt like I was in a a time in my life than that, that that shouldn't be happening. So I sought out kind of traditional medical treatments and diagnoses and, you know, found my way into a more holistic energetic approach to my um, body issues, but my chronic pain didn't necessarily go away. It would get better for a while. And then I'd find myself back in the cycle of appointments and treatments. And it wasn't until um, my sister actually invited me to a melt class that I thought, oh, okay, well, let me, let me just look into this. I'd never heard of it. Was, was familiar with fascia, was familiar with, you know, connective tissue, one and the same, um, but didn't really have an understanding of it. So I honestly went on the web and Google Melt Method and went on their website and um, somebody reached through the computer screen and grabbed me in because it was everything that I had been looking for um, in a practice. So I started melting and within a few months I was signing up to become an instructor because I really felt like it was something I could not only embody for me to help my body um, calm down and deal with my chronic pain issues, but also I could bring that to others as well. So that's kind of where I landed. So it was, is MELT an acronym for something? It actually is, or I should say it used to be Beth. Um, when Sue originally created the methodology, she, um, she coined it for myofascial energetic length lengthening technique. But she very quickly realized in her research and um, studying of the fascial system that 
Myofascia is simply the muscle layer. And I shouldn't say simply, but it is the layer of fascia that is invested in our muscle structure. And the fascia actually is multi-layered. Um, if you were to take a scalpel to it, <laughs> it, it really isn't, doesn't have layers to it because we are a whole system, but um, for the sake of research and science and study. Um, so she, anyway, she dropped that acronym, but loved the visualization of melt and, you know, kind of what that word represents. So kept that name. So that's kind of how it evolved. And you really do melt with melt. And you really do melt. <laughs> <laughs> so, so good. Um, so I'm immediately thinking for our listeners, um, we, we talk on a pretty regular basis about how trauma is stored in the body and then it can be released from the body. Um, but it's sometimes when we say that people are like, what are you talking about? I was there and maybe I have the memories of, of what happened or worse. They might say like, I have a vague idea that, that some things may have happened to me, but I don't really have any memories. How could anyone possibly say that this is stored in my body? Um, so I would be so curious to, to hear you like anything sort of basic for our listeners. And certainly for me to hear it in a different way, how is, how is trauma stored in the body? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And <clears throat> I'm going to kind of give you an overview of our fascial system in that it is head to toe and skin to bones. It's everything that our, we know our system isn't. So we know our muscles, we know our bones, we know our organs, anybody with a you know basic knowledge of biology can in, envision all of those things existing in our bodies and where they exist. Fascia is everything else. So it is the, the system that houses our nervous system, our circulatory system. It surrounds and protects our organs. It's in our brains, it's in, you know, every part of us has a fascial component. And ideally when that fascia is healthy and vibrant, you can kind of envision that it looks like a spider web. It's um, multifaceted, it's fluid, it has a um, fluid system to it that not only incorporates the interior but the exterior of the cells. And when fascia is dehydrated, it kind of looks like a cobweb. <laughs> so those areas get sticky. You know, a spider web moves with the wind and flows and cobwebs do not. Um, another analogy I use is a kitchen sponge. When it's hydrated and, and soft and pliable and it holds fluid and holds water, when it's dehydrated, it's stiff, it doesn't move well, and you really have to work to get water to, to absorb into a dehydrated sponge. So, you know, those analogies aside, our bodies are this complex system of oneness. <laughs> um, nothing happens within our bodies without the rest of our body knowing about it. So when our trauma happens, stress happens to us, our body doesn't really uh, differentiate between emotional stress, physical stress, traumatic stress, um, which is why we call that dehydration or that stress stuck because it really does get stuck in that tissue. That tissue, if you can imagine, is a living environment it is full of billions of cells in our system. And when it's stiff and stuck, it holds on to those stresses. And our nervous system can get impacted. Again, our circulatory system, every system in our body can really be have a, a reaction and an impaction from that stress that we hold on to. Does that make sense? Ever. 
You know, I think um, as you're talking, I can see all of that happening in my mind, what you're describing. And some people aren't as skilled at visualizing things. And so I just wanted to enter into like real world ways that you'll know if you have stuck stress myofascial or fat in your fascia. For me, and I don't know about you, Shelly, so I'd love to hear you. The way I recognized that I had some fascia issues I wanted to address is um, knots in my back that were, I mean, I would go to a massage therapist very frequently, like every other week, and it was always the same, bah, 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 up my shoulder blades, right? Uh-huh. And so since doing melt, I don't have that at all. And that was 20 years I had those bumps in there, right? Another way is just general stick stiffness and creakiness that I felt. So what the issue for me was, is that those areas that might be like knots in your muscles, you think they're in your muscles, right? Right. And you go to a massage therapist and don't wince when I say the shelling, they'll put their elbow in there, you know, and get it out. And that actually does not end up helping the fascia in the long run. So I would love to hear you talk about other ways people might identify if they have stuck stress and then why it might not be good to bully it out of your system. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. So sex stress presents itself in a lot of ways that a lot of us will be very familiar with. Um, That idea that you have to kind of unwind when you stand up or get out of bed. Um, Again, that kind of stiffness that you feel. And, you know, for most of us, we stand up out of a chair, we unwind, we do our little stretch, we walk out of the room and we kind of forget about it because it's, you know, we've, we've got ourselves moving again, but it can also present itself as headaches, uh, lack of sleep. You, although you may be very tired in the afternoon, you may need an afternoon nap and go to bed at night and find yourself wide awake. Um, it can present itself as digestive issues. Um, anxiety and depression are common responses to stuck stress. So, you know, joint aches and pains, muscle aches and pains. Again, that idea that you've got some chronic pain going on, but you haven't really done anything to create that response in your body that we all are familiar with. You know, we know when we stub our toe, our toe's gonna hurt for a little while, but all of a sudden we've got knots in our back and we haven't done anything to really associate with those knots to, you know, think, okay, there's a reason for those. So again, with that idea that fascia is body wide, it's easy to start to understand how body wide issues can come about from some of that stuck stress. For me, it was a combination of um, some shoulder and neck issues that I knew where those come came from in my body. I'd had some, some injury from in that area, but I couldn't get rid of them. No matter how much PT or exercise or massage therapy, I just couldn't get those out of my, out of my body. Um, and another one that also is very common with folks that I suffered from was plantar fasciitis. And so I had these deep aches in my feet um, that I just, again, couldn't get rid of on a permanent basis. I could sort of get rid of them for a while and then they would come back. And, um, so, you know, there are a lot of physical reasons why stress presents itself in our bodies. What happens over time is when we have those areas of stuck stress and we keep ignoring them because we feel like they're common aches and pains, they're normal parts of aging, they're whatever we associate or or tell ourselves to disassociate from those feelings in our body. It begins to build and we end up with issues that don't feel like they should be a physical problem. We don't understand that that it can boil back down to that stuck stress because they seem to be bigger issues. They get, we get into that chronic pain cycle. We get into um, more nervous system issues and um, gut issues, digestive issues. Those things start to snowball because our 
system isn't taking care of itself. That autonomic system isn't allowed to reset at night. Um, and we're, you know, we just are on this path to chronic stuck stress. I wanted to jump in and say, um, if, if anybody out there is like, yeah, I know that I, I know that I am tense, but I don't really know, you know, a lot of times, like what you said, Shelly, about being dissociated or kind of checked out. Um, I like to ask my clients, you know, have you ever seen a cat? Have you ever seen a dog? And usually they'll say, of course I have. And like, if you, if a cat is sleeping and then you like poke it in the belly, it'll wake up, scratch you, bite you. And then if the threat has passed and it sort of glares at you, like, why did you do that? Uh, it will then stretch out, curl back up into a ball and go back to sleep. Animals can cycle up into the threat response in order to respond to threat appropriately. And then they can cycle right back down. You know, thinking about your sleeping dog, here's the mailman, barks at the door, hackles are up, whole body is tense, mailman leaves and the dog sort of pats itself on the back, like, good job, you kept this house safe from the mailman one more time. And then, you know, go back over to your dog bed. Maybe you stretch, maybe you don't circle around a couple of times and then lay back down. So other animals know how to release stress. They know how to go up into that threat response when they perceive it to be necessary and appropriate, but they're not vibrating in it all the time. So you guys were talking about like muscle aches and pains. And if you're out there, I want you to think about, um, if you're out there listening, one of the examples I like to give to my clients is imagine, you know, your untreated trauma as something as a beach ball that you're holding underneath the water. Like, what does it actually take for you to do that? These like strong, stiff arms, tensed up shoulders and a whole body system that is wiring for suppression, which is enormously energy consumptive for us. Yes. And then, you know, if we further this analogy, if somebody's like, do you want to go to a different part of the water? And you're like, what? No, not me. No, I'm going to stay here. And they're like, is it, does it have anything to do with the beach ball you're holding under the water? And you're like, what beach ball? What are you talking about? But if somebody bumps into you, you're, you're like vibrating with the pain. You think it's that person bumping into you because you've, it's almost like you've trained your body and your mind to forget about the beach ball that you've pushed down under the water. And a lot of people that, that Tab and I work with, and it sounds like you too, are kind of coming in with that level of pain suppression, emotional suppression. Um, And so when people tell me they feel fine, I'm like, do you mean fine is like numb, checked out and disconnected? Or do you mean fine is like open, flowing, peaceful, grounded? Yes. And that's usually when I get them because they're like, oh, I guess I mean the former and not the latter. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's several times in class when I will, especially in an introductory uh, setting, when I will list the um, symptoms of some stuck stress. And, you know, at the beginning of class, I'll say, how's everybody doing? And everybody is that typical fine. And then I'll list those symptoms and how many people have those symptoms. And every single person can raise their hand and identify with something on that list. I think the most important thing that melt brings to the table is this gentleness of the technique and this idea that we are tapping into not only our fascia but but more importantly our nervous system and we are going to do that in a way that is comforting and feels good and does not elicit a flight or fight response which you know, speaking back to what Tabitha said earlier, when she kind of said, you're not going to want to hear me say the elbow in the, you know, muscle. Um, That's what most of us culturally are tuned into. I can pound it out of me. If I just press a little harder, that, that knot's going to go away. If I just work a little harder, I won't have to deal with this. Um, This idea that we can push through the pain, emotional or physical, and it'll be better on the other side if I just push through that. <clears throat> what Melt brings to the table is this idea that it's the gentleness 
of the methodology that starts to open up the cells in our connective tissue and our fascia in a way that lets the fluid start to flow again. And our, our body knows how to do that. The system is, you know, has been, has had a fluid flow since the, before we were born. So it knows that that cycle and that circulation and that ability to bring ease into our, our whole body, our nervous system, our physical system. And it's that gentleness that ha is the greatest impact. So, you know, nothing about melt should hurt. Um, nothing about anything you do to your fascial system should hurt, whether you're melting or whether you're doing something, some other practition. Um, <clears throat> you should come into that space gently. And that's a hard, that's a hard concept for people because they, that's not what we're taught. That's not what we see in advertisements. That's not what we hear from our, you know, gym or our wherever we're going to kind of release some of that. So um, it, it is a really important component to that idea of self-care. And again, that's kind of a tough, it's a tough nut to crack for some folks. But the other thing I really love about this particular methodology is that you can take it in very small chunks. You can have a 10 minute melt. You can have a three minute melt. You can have an hour long session and you're gonna feel the, the benefit from it. So, I certainly feel the benefit from it. Um, Shelly, one of the things that a lot of us with CPTS do, we're already touching on it, is this chronic self-neglect. And we prioritize a lot of other things before ourselves, and in, in fact, everything sometimes before ourselves. And um, so I really want to stress the issue that if you have to start someplace Water awareness, hydration awareness, especially with your fascia is really important. And if you're somebody who already thinks you drink a lot of water, I was there too. And I did drink a lot of water and it still didn't get to where it needed to go because it was bound up. Can you talk just a little bit about the moistness of fascia and, you know, and how also, so not only that that needs to be open so that it can get the water, but then also our nervous system is sitting in something that is supposed to be moist and fluid simply for electrical conductivity, right? To get the electrical impulses to go. <clears throat> so would you mind talking a little bit about those two things, why we have to address the fascia to get the hydration in there, simply drinking more water won't cut it. Um, and then talk about all you've learned in 20 minutes about the nervous system. <laughs> Absolutely, okay. So I appreciate that. And we're gonna go back oh, just a moment to that kitchen sponge analogy because when we have that kitchen sponge that's already hydrated, it's already moist, it comes fresh out of the package and we put it under the faucet to get it wet, that water is gonna absorb right into it. That sponge sets on the counter for a few days or a week and it gets all dried out. We stick it under the faucet and the water runs off of it, literally. Same sponge, same properties, just the difference between hydration and dehydration. So that same thing happens within our fascial system. When it gets dehydrated, those cells close down and they simply don't absorb the water that we're consuming. So again, I was one of those folks that thought I was really good at drinking water. And I was also really good at peeing all of that right back out of my system. Um, so, and, and which is, unfortunately, it stops a lot of folks from drinking water on a regular basis because they just feel like all I do is spend it in the bathroom. So I'm not gonna, if I don't drink, I won't have to you know, go visit the restroom as often. So to get that little gentle compression going in our systems and get those cells to open back up again, allows that water to be absorbed back into that fascia in a way that uses it appropriately in our system. So speaking on the nervous system component of that, you know, imagine 
now like a, a pond that doesn't have any uh, fresh water flow through it. So it's kind of stagnant. Maybe it's kind of stinky. Um, maybe it's kind of green. You know, we've all seen those areas. Um, we can kind of imagine that when our fluid isn't flowing in our body and it gets stuck in those areas, it gets stagnant. And so our cells don't uptake that stagnant fluid. They recognize it as not the best option for them. They'd rather stay dehydrated than uptake stagnant fluid. So that idea that when we have that system functioning more appropriately, the water that we're consuming is going to be used within our whole body more appropriately. You know, when it comes specifically down to the nervous system, when those, when all of those <laughs> nerve endings are living in stagnant, dehydrated fascia, it is not communicating back with appropriate method, with appropriate messages. So, you know, our muscles don't fire appropriately. Our um, digestive system doesn't function appropriately. It's just not getting, it might be getting part of the message, but not the whole message. Um, another easy way to understand kind of that nervous system communication pathway is <clears throat> imagine you're commuting to the city for work every day. And you put on your Google Maps or your Apple Maps and you, you know, have your commute all lined out. And, and most of the time when you go into the city on a regular basis, um, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., it's going to route you the back way because it knows how to get you from point A to point B, the quickest route. Our nervous system does the same thing. When there are areas of dehydration, stuck traffic, as you might have it, um, it's going to route you the way that is most efficient for your body. Now comes the weekend and you want to go back to the city and the map takes you back on the back roads again and you get stuck in a two hour trip to the city that would only have taken you 45 minutes if you'd have just gone the freeway, but your body doesn't know how to go the freeway. Your body knows how to go the back roads. So that nervous system over time gets to a point where it doesn't know the quickest route anymore. It only knows how to reroute itself around those areas of stuck stress. So <clears throat> one thing fascia is really, really good at is compensating for who you are, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, if you sit at a desk and you work all day and you're kind of hunched over a keyboard and your shoulders are kind of forward and your chest is kind of concave, your fascia assumes that that's, that's normal for you and that's how it's going to um, respond best is in that position. So the nervous system getting that ability to have all that fluid flow back around it will immediately respond. Another beautiful thing about our human body is, again, it knows what where it was, where it was when it was born, <laughs> for lack of a better way to say that. Um, so it can return to that pretty quickly. And over time, it just continues to return to that place easier and easier and easier. So the, the little bit of, of self-care that you do for that fascial system, for that nervous system builds over time to become, a, you know, your new normal. Yeah, go for it, Beth. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna say like your new normal is so, I think relatable for our clients and probably for, for me and Tabitha as well, um, where you, someone is like, wow, you seem really like stressed out and controlling. And you're like, uh, do, what, this is it. This is how I, this is where I live. This is, and, or if I was recently reading something where it was talking about workaholism and it was like, do you get mad at people who don't take your stress as seriously as you do? And it was so funny to read it that way. Cause the idea in your mind is like, this stress is valid. It is pertinent. I need it. And then someone else going like, 
you seem like you're, you know, you seem like you're really stressed out or you seem like you're really controlling and you're like, you don't get it. Um, but that a lot of, uh, a lot of the people that we work in service of, um, ignore, ignore their bodies, uh, cries for help, ignore, ignore pain cues. Mm-hmm. Um, and I read somewhere, uh, someone was saying that pain is like prayer, you know, that your body is essentially crying out to you, the highest self who actually has the ability to take an action. Um, you know, so we, or whomever, you know, maybe believes in some, some manner of higher power, you pray to your higher power because you're like, I'm struggling. I need help. I need something. Or like, I don't know what to do. And I'm stuck this idea. We're imagining that, you know, some greater source, um, has more information on how to help. But if your plantar fasciitis is praying to you, crying to you, like, please do something for me. And you're like, well, that's just how it's supposed to be. That's just how it's supposed to be. You just got to deal with it. Um, many years ago, I was in a therapist's office and I was like, you know, what? I'm just really suffering and I'm pretty miserable. And she was like, but you know, in the Buddhist perspective, isn't that kind of just like how it's supposed to be? And I was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> And so I think that sometimes we have to, you might have to hear somebody say radiant health is your birthright. And you need to be hearing it from someone that you trust enough to not be like, well, that sounds like some pretty woo woo, like wild stuff. And we're like, no, we mean you can get out of pain. Yes. And if someone has like, uh, if their mental patterning or the story is like, I am my pain or pain is my life or uh, life is pain. And the best you can do to cope with the pain of life is just power through it or use something, coffee, alcohol, substances, work, um, sex, porn, dating websites, you name it for uh, to, to mitigate the misery. And then we're saying, listen to what your body is asking you for. And then when the student is ready, the teacher appears because you're talking to me about melt. And I'm like, well, I got to go look this stuff up. Sounds so good. And both of you are nodding your heads like, yeah, does it work? I'm going to say, please do. Please do. (laughs) Um, You know, what you're talking about, Beth, is so important. And we've touched on it in, I think, many of our episodes. Um, So just using myself as an example, the first time I went to a good therapist, (laughs) right? Um, And there are different levels of skill in all professions. The first time I went to a therapist that really got me on my road to health, she told me I was a floating head because I had become a professional at ignoring my body cues. And, And I had to do that growing up to survive because that would not have been safe for me to recognize those all the time. Um, But as an adult, it really made me rethink a lot of my life experience. And the first thing I noticed for me, and it may be the same for some of you out there in listening land, is that as I learned to relax, my shoulders started relaxing more. That was the first cue to me, right? But I still needed massages. I have been in several car accidents. And that's also something that goes with CPTSD is more trauma from varying sources. We can talk about that in eight or nine episodes, right? But the idea of I'm just going to have to suffer because my body has been literally impacted was just ingrained in me. And the first time I went to a melt uh, demonstration was at a local center here in my town. And um, Shelly, you'll probably know what this was exactly and can tell us, but um, we did a, a melt treatment. We took an assessment and that's one of the things I like about melt is that you assess, assess, assess all the way through it. And that is how your brain knows things are changing. And so that's a really, I think a very loving supportive component of melt. So we did an assessment at the beginning of how far you can bend over and, you know, do your fingertips match as you're bent over. And then we did uh, melt on half of our body and did that assessment again. And I had this much difference in how far my fingers could reach. So four inches in one 20 minute session. Now melt is a miracle, but it's not going to be a one-time thing, right? So Shelly, can you talk a little bit about how I got so much difference bending over one arm would go almost all the way to the ground and the other was still dangling at my wrist. What is that about? Well, there you have hydration at its finest. Um, And, you know, in, in melt land, 
again, the L is, stands for lengthening. So we lengthen our fascial tissue um, and create those that space for our body to exist. I mean, this, this idea that you can really tune in and thank you for bringing up assessments, Tabitha, because um, it is where we start and finish and check in throughout a melt session um, to know where you are at your beginning. And it's never a point of or a place of judgment. It's just simply a check-in. We give you cues as to what you might be feeling, what you could be feeling, what stuck stress feels like when we focus in on a certain area. And that idea that you can, you know, bend, stand up, bend over, reach toward the floor, kind of assess how far your fingers go. You know, it's an easy physical assessment. It's an easy visual assessment. Um, and then come back, melt your foot, which is what you were doing was a foot treatment. So you were taking that small, um, soft ball, different areas in the bottom of your foot and bringing hydration into your whole system. Because again, we are a whole system. So that hydration came oh, up. I'm gonna interrupt there because my mind is blown. First of all, two things you just said, make space for your body to exist. And that was really powerful, Shelly, because we don't do that. And the other thing is I didn't remember what treatment it was. So you're telling me that I got that much lengthening from in my arms from my feet. Yes. And that's the whole being. Yes. That is the whole. Sorry thing. to interrupt. I just got so, excited there. <laughs> no. And, and it gives me goosebumps. I, I mean, literally the hair is standing up on my arms, just talking about it because it is so impactful and in such a simple way. And you can see the difference. You can feel the difference. Um, that arm length change is simply that fluid flow coming up that side of your body that you just worked on your foot. And then you go to, to melt the other foot, you do that same reach and magically your arms are now reaching the same length or roughly the same length again. So, and the other interesting component to that, and I'll just touch on this momentarily, but if you waited about 10 minutes to do that arm length check-in, only having melted one side of your body, they wouldn't be so dramatic because the fluid flow would go throughout your whole system if you just wait long enough. But checking in immediately, it hasn't had that opportunity to you know, make it its way around. Um, it was a good dramatic point though. It is. It's a very good dramatic point. And Beth and I talk all the time about both sides of your body. And so I really just love that you tied that back in like melt will help you or fascia work, but I prefer melt, right? Fascia work right. will help you hydrate the whole, even if you only do parts. Yes, absolutely. Every time yep. it doesn't matter where you work, you may feel some tension in your necks. You may do some upper body work. Um, with our soft foam roller or with the balls, um, but you're never going to just work that one part of your body. Um, you know, we do a rest assessment where we're laying on the floor, checking in on, you know, common imbalances. So over the course of uh, teaching melt to tens of thousands of people who created this, you know, these four common imbalances that most of us feel because we all have stuck stress. So, um, you know, we lay on the floor and check on those. We work on maybe an upper body sequence. We come back in and check in. Well, magically my lower body feels better. So, um, yeah, you just, you, you're always working your entire system. I think Beth would like to chime in. I'd love to, I'd love to make a comparison, um, which is, uh, you know, one day in, in, uh, in a fantasy world, there's a, there's a medical doctor, his name is Dr. Uh, Ashok Gupta. And what he has created is what's called the Gupta program for breaking that loop of like chronic stress in your mind, creating chronic stress in your body. Um, and one of the things he talks about is how, like, if you are thinking about your symptoms your insula and your amygdala can't tell the difference between real and perceived threat 
real and perceived stress, real and perceived threat. So if you've got chronic fatigue syndrome or um, uh, maybe even long COVID, or in my case, it was like some chronic like GI digestion and um, like reproductive issues. And when the symptoms start coming up, if your mind starts going, oh no, here we go again. Oh no, I'm going to be really tired and I'm not going to be able to go to my daughter's birthday party like I thought. Um, and, and your brain can actually go, oh, okay, well, this worry about the symptoms must mean that there are the presence of the symptoms. And then it inflames your like immune response to respond to the symptoms, which were only just worrying about whether or not the symptoms were like coming and going to be there. And so when you talk about the gentleness aspect of melt, it also makes me think about like talking to yourself as if what you're doing is this act of like love and care and nurturance. So one of the things that, you know, and we'll put a link in the show notes today for the Gupta program. I've taken it myself. It's super cool. Um, and he does parts work with puppets. This man is egoless. Cause he's like, maybe if you're a too much of an achiever and he like pulls up this little cheerleader, that's like the puppet it's beyond adorable. Um, oh, I might've lost my train of thought. Uh, but one of the things he says is, is when you notice that you're thinking about the problem, you can go stop. That's just a loop in the brain. It doesn't mean that I'm in danger right now, because if our bodies can't perceive the difference between our bodies and minds can't perceive the difference between real and perceived threat, I'm tense in my shoulders. And then I get an email from my boss that says, we need to talk. And the tension that I'm already carrying in my body is basically saying like, and this is a threat too. And this is a threat. And everything that you're receiving sensorily from outside of you, your body, which is already tense and ready for threat is like, well, everything is threat that I have to guard myself against. Can you talk a little bit about what, um, what people post melt experience related to like how they're, they're moving through the world kind of beyond just like the release of stress and tension but like how, how much more clearly is someone able to see their life absent stuck stress in their body? Well, that's a really good question. So a couple of things, I'll give you a kind of an emotional and a physical response. Um, when I started teaching melt, I was still working um, as an administrative assistant and the um, building that I worked in also housed um, some physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, and, and this particular physical therapist has, had known me for several years. And, uh, I was probably about three months or so into my melt teaching. Um, so I'd become certified instructor and I was walking down the hallway one day and she came up behind me and grabbed my shoulders and said, I don't know what you're doing, but you are com a completely different person physically. And it was like, oh, thank you. Whoa. So she could sense just in my physical presence that my posture had changed. My, my presence had changed. And, you know, that ties into the emotional component of it in that, you know, I had more energy, I was sleeping better, I was moving through my world better and starting that process of connecting to places in my body that I hadn't connected to because of that chronic pain story um, and feeling better about it. I could feel the difference. It's an incremental change. Um, the beautiful thing about, again, a melt practice is that you, you do a melt treatment, you feel better instantly, but you also feel better over time. And that, that feeling better gets, you know, the, 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 the starting spot gets more and more 
uh, what do I want to say? It just, it just, you, you start from a new space. You have this, this um, physical and emotional relief of knowing that, okay, now when I do a rest assessment, I feel much different. In fact, you know, one of the tools that we use a lot with our clients is a journal. It's a simple place of, you know, write down where, where you're starting from. And that, that doesn't matter whether it's physical stuff or emotional stuff, just kind of write down a few notes for yourself because over time, as we start to feel better, we forget where our starting place was. Um, and we can go back and look and go, oh, okay, I used to not be able to sit on the floor crisscross applesauce and now I can, or, you know, whatever your uh, improvement and, and beginning was. So um, it really has that ability to soften and, um, you know, your, your nervous system becomes quieter. You don't respond to stresses as much. You have a different place, a different ability to handle those incoming stresses because your nervous system is in a healthier place to begin with. And you have the tools, more importantly, to come back and go, when you do have a stressful situation present itself to you, you have tools to come back and go, okay, I can do you know, something we call the rebalance sequence, which is totally neurological. Um, 10 minutes breathing exercise that connects your body to your center of gravity, which happens to be our pelvis, and allows us to <sighs> reconnect and settle ourselves down. I did one before this podcast <laughs> 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 to quiet my nervous system. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Shelley, I want to just um, capitalize a little bit on what you're talking about. That I think what you were describing earlier about how things just keep progressing is that our baseline of wellness moves. Yes. And so the things that used to be just how it is, I'm always hurting, I'm always tired, go away. And it is a practice. You can't just do it sometimes and get long lasting effects like anything, right? But what I noticed um, for myself to link in CPTSD and the emotional component. Sometimes I grew up in a very rejecting critical place. And so I had learned over time how to hunch in and hold myself so that those things would deflect, right? At least that's what I thought I was doing. And so for me, there was a lot of upper body tension. And as I melted, what I realized is that I was starting to be like my chest opened up I had more mobility in my shoulders, my head would turn further. And we talked about this a long time ago, I had a, my propio sensors. So like what tells me where I'm at in space and time aligned. So I didn't feel out of balance. I didn't, I, I have an inner ear thing also. So I didn't run into walls literally anymore. And it really shifted my whole perception of how grounded I am on the planet and what I can handle. And my, my handling went through the roof with, it was like the cherry on the top of all the psychotherapy and, and spiritual work I've done melt linked it all together in my body. And that moving baseline, I'm not the same per person physically as I was before either. And what I've noticed is because I'm reading my environment more correctly, not everything is a threat. Yeah. I'm less tense overall. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's just a change in perception there, but also I have more capacity because I'm not overwhelmed with all of the non-existent threats that I think are threatening to see real things coming down the road sooner and know how to handle them. So when there is a threat that comes in for real, I have more capacity, not only in my mind and emotion and my psyche, but in my body to just make a decision about what I'm going to do. Yes. That's huge. Just being able to make a decision. Go for it, Beth. Yeah. I want to chime in to also say that what you, what you were speaking on is so, so relatable of things I hear in my clinical practice with my clients, which is that hunched over posture also sends messages to everyone else that you're interacting with that you're not open. You're not open for connection. You're not open for like affirmation. Um, if you're essentially carrying in your mind, the worldview uh, or like the belief, the world is not a safe place. 
the body posture, like people are, everyone is a threat that I have to protect myself against. And then someone's like, can I buy you coffee? And you're like, wow, no. Ah! <laughs> or someone's like, Hey, do you want to lovingly resolve this conflict with me? And they're, and you're like, no, ah, you're a villain. I'm a victim. And you're like running away before you're even getting an opportunity to like, see what that circumstance might bring to you, um, from a place of learning. And as you're talking, right. So putting yourself in stretching and touching your toes, if that's not available to you, is like to a degree discomfort, like you can feel discomfort with that. However, when you are taking little steps to create, to create that sensation of, of like stretch, and then you, you tell your brain, you can handle this, you're doing okay. And then what you're doing is actually creating a memory bank in your hippocampus of you handling things that are difficult instead of everything coming into your sense experience, getting shunted immediately to your amygdala to send threat response throughout your body all the time. So then the day that you do get that email from your boss, that's like, we need to talk. And you're like, we do. I need to go tell this person that I don't love it when they send me emails with the subject line, all caps, like, I don't know if that's a generational thing, you know, where someone like the email is the subject and it's like a long all cap subject and you read it and you're like, oh God. <laughs> so you, you go tell this person, you're like, hey, I can't imagine for any reason that you'd be doing this on purpose, but here's how I receive it. And then they go, oh, I had no idea. <laughs> and so to Tab's point of like, I go from being closed off to like more aware, Right. And then I'm saying that the more open and aware you are, um, the less of your resources are being, you know, stolen by trying to push that beach ball down underneath the water, the more you can actually be like awed and stupefied by the beauty of life. Yes. And, you know, kind of wrapping that into, you know, our body's response to, again, stressors our bodies are amazing at compensation. They do it so well all of the time. And we know that because it is what protects us from that trauma or that trauma response. It is how we survive for a lot of folks is that compensation, that, that inward pull when you're trying to protect yourself or that exterior, you know, uh, posture when you, want the world to perceive you to be strong and and controlling. Um, And we don't even realize it. We're there before we even realize it. And the the beautiful thing about the MELT method in particular is that it meets people where they are in their journey. Whether you can um, stand on a little round ball and do a foot treatment or whether you have to sit in a chair to do that foot treatment because your foot cannot handle the compression of that ball. Whether you can get down on the floor and do some work with our roller or whether you have to do it in your bed or whether you have to do it up against a wall. Um, Whether you can do an hour long class or whether you have to take it in three minute chunks. It's that, that knowledge that you can take these little bits and create changes that impact your whole self. And that's, that's where I see the, the, the benefit on the most. I love Tabitha saying that, you know, her proprioception had changed, you know, how she felt inside how she viewed the world exterior was a different place and knowing that again that fascia is all that we are it is the most um, pervasive system in our body Um, there's conversation in the fascial research world about it being the largest organ in our body Um, we began to understand how critical it is to to health 
the vibrancy of our fascia, but also how easy it is. And I, you know, I, I hesitate using that word easy um, in all honesty, because, you know, we do have that um, ability to make ourselves the last person we think of. Um, so I, I encourage folks to really step into a place where to try out some, something to get that system back into health. What they say a lot in the 12 step, the mutual support community is like, it's simple, not easy, right? That like, when it comes to, um, doing something gentle for yourself. If you are one of those people who wired for your uh, traumatic upbringing with, by being like extremely controlling, perfectionistic, you restrict food, you exercise, like, um, like there's a place you're going to get to where you're going to outrun your shame. Um, the reason I'm saying all this is because I know that road and I've been down it. Um, when somebody says relax, it's actually a simple concept, but no, it, it is not easy if you have CPTSD. We say sit still for five minutes, or can you breathe deep for 30 seconds with your eyes closed? I had someone tell me once they were like, not with you in the room. I can't do that. Um, if you're relaxed, you're not paying attention. Nothing could be more dangerous for me. And so when we talk about like, right, simple versus easy, gentle self-care, is simple in simple conceptually. And for you as a CPTSD survivor, it may be one of the hardest things you ever do. Um, and that's why, you know, Shelly's really saying, take it minute by minute, take it, do three minutes or uh, entertain the possibility that you might be willing to start thinking about <laughs> whatever, whatever, wherever you are, and then go, and this is okay, because it makes sense where I'm at, right? So one of the, one of the things we always say on this podcast is we want to leave you with some salient takeaways of um, what would help today. And if what you're hearing sounds really good, and you're like, well, yeah, but I do hot yoga for hours during my week. So clearly, I don't need melt, because I'm already beating my body up in like X, Y, and Z way. Um, my encouragement would be, or my, my kind of like one thing to, to take away is ask your body if it feels like punishment or if it feels like self-care, check into yourself that way. So not what does my head say? The one that's got this imaginary me that I'm just going to transform into and then be worth, you know, loving, um, ask your body today does the hours of CrossFit or the, you know, the hours of hot yoga, um, does it feel like self-care or does it feel like uh, punishment or control? And then listen to your body. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was a really good point, Beth. I'm so glad you brought that up. I think, um, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, Beth. I haven't been paying attention. Okay. So one of the things that I would offer as a takeaway, and I'm going to just pitch this to you, Shelly. Um, the breathing approach that I learned in Melt, I use with clients now, instead of some of the other approaches. Would you mind um, putting us uh, to the test to see if we can do maybe some 3D breathing? Or I can't, is that what Melt calls it? I can't remember. Yeah, it calls it, yes. okay. We call it the 3D breath breakdown, and then we bring it all together in a 3D breath. So let's do that together. Um, we're gonna place one hand on our chest and one hand on our belly. And we're gonna breathe what we call depth into our diaphragm. So we're gonna breathe toward those palms of our hands, but we're also gonna breathe toward our back at the same time. And it doesn't have to be the deepest breath you take. It's just a slow, gentle breath, breathing depth into your diaphragm. Let's do one more in that direction. And then we're gonna switch our hands to the sides of our ribs. And we're gonna think about breathing width into our diaphragm. So we're just gonna let that rib cage expand toward the palms of our hands. And then as we exhale and contract, we'll go back to the center line. 
Now, what I'm going to say as we're breathing width into our diaphragm is that if you don't feel this sensation, it doesn't matter because you're thinking that direction and your body will respond as if it is moving in that direction. All right, let's try our third dimension. We're gonna bring one hand down kind of below belly and bring the other hand just below the collarbones, kind of at the heart space. And we're gonna about, think about breathing length into the torso. So we're, that's if we're filling the belly up to the bottom and the lungs up to the top in equal timing. We're just gonna take a couple of breaths here. You can also imagine this particular breath as breathing space into your spine. And let's do one more breath here. And then we're gonna bring those dimensions all together. So we're gonna bring the hands down to your low belly. And we're just gonna think about taking an inhale breath that fills our belly and lungs in that depth and width and length dimensions. So let's just take a breath there. And then we're gonna take another breath there, but this time we're gonna use a, a sound to exhale. And I'm gonna encourage you all to just use the SH sound for um, ease of instruction. So let's take a nice six-sided inhalation. And then as we exhale, we're going to use an SH sound. Let's do one more. Thank you, Shelley. Could you give us just a two second, okay, 20 second rundown on why that shh or the ha sound when you're exhaling is helpful? It connects to there's <clears throat> in simple terms, that vibration that you feel in the roof of your mouth connects to your core. Different sounds work for different people. We use SH, SE or HA sounds on our exhale breath. Um, in Chinese medicine, they connect to different organs in your body, but it just allows that connection to your core, to your neural core, to strengthen as you exhale. Thank you. So if you think making those noises as you're exhaling is stupid, just give it a shot and see what you notice. Yeah. Do you have any last minute tips for us, Shelly, before we wrap up for today? I guess my, my final thought for the day is that you know, melt really is a foundational practice. Um, it will benefit you <clears throat> whether you are um, healing from traumatic stress. It will benefit you if you want to melt before your exercise program, if you want to melt before your yoga program. It taps into a place that exercise doesn't really tap into, diet and and. Um, those, you know, programs, those, those practices don't really tap into that connective tissue system, that fascial system like melt does. Um, it's not a religion. It's not a cure, but it will help your body find its healing on its, where it needs to be. So, you know, it's a 10 minute a day practice. Um, again, you can start where you need to start. And now I, I invite you to just give it a try. <laughs> I invite you to do the same. Give it a try. I melt my feet every night before I go to bed and it has improved my sleep dramatically. Uh, and, be, and I notice when I don't do it, not so restful. So Beth, do you have anything you'd like to say before we wrap up today? When, yes, so uh, when I heard, it's, it's funny to, to sort of be in, be in a highly perfectionistic uh, body, worldview, nervous system. So Shelly goes, 10 minutes a day. And I go, oh God, I'm not doing enough. Folks, try it for three minutes one time and see if you like it. And if that works for you, you know, like the, the whole idea here is that you don't have to flip a switch and become 
you don't have to bring that same kind of workaholic intense energy into healing your trauma more like you'll try you'll try things you'll find things that work um we want you to have as many options as there are because one of the things we didn't get a chance to do right now or, or talk about too much in this podcast is when you go to your doctor with chronic pain or stress and they say what do you want um antidepressants uh would you like to go on some muscle relaxants or uh you know is, is surgery what, what you need? And what we're trying to say kind of over and over and over again, is that your body has so much wisdom about what it needs. And what we're trying to ask you to do little by little over time is peel away the sticky layers that have made it unavailable to listen to your body. So Shelly, where can people find you? Where can people find information about melt? Um, here is your kind of plug spot. How, if someone wanted to work with you, how would they find you? Okay. So my business is called Flex Your Ability. So you can find me at uh, www.flexyourability.com. Um, you can find more information about the Melt Method there. I have a direct link to their page, or you can go directly to meltmethod.com. And there are a myriad of ways to learn how to melt. You can melt directly with me. I do classes on Zoom. I do private sessions. You can go to um, the Melt Method page and find Melt On Demand and um, plug into that. They have introductory programs on the Melt Method page. I offer introductory workshops um, occasionally through my um, website as well. So, and, and there's even a presence on YouTube now. So the Mount Method has a great presence on YouTube. If you just want to go watch a little bit and go, all right, that looks kind of interesting. And you can, you know, just watch a 10 minute video and see what you think. Um, the only thing I really highly recommend is if you want to make that commitment to try Melt, two things. The YouTube channel has a Melt for Beginners section that does not require melt equipment. Sue has put together this lovely seven day program where instead of using a soft foam roller, she rolls up uh, bath towels and uses those as a way to kind of, you know, step your toes in the water without making the investment. If you want to make the investment, please purchase melt equipment. It is designed specifically by Sue Hitzman for this methodology and you know, I would say for people who think, well, I'm just going to grab a golf ball and put a golf ball under my foot and rub that. I'm thinking that the golf balls are for golf. Melt balls are for melt. <laughs> so again, being gentle to your system is what it's all about. And the melt tools will provide that um, the appropriate tool for the job. But again, you can go on that, melt, on that YouTube channel Mount Method YouTube channel and um, search out the beginner um, seven day program and just kind of check it out. And it doesn't have to be done every day for seven days. You can do it once a week for seven weeks if you'd like, <laughs> but it'll just give you an idea of what, what it's like. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Shelly, and for all of this great information, especially the emphasis that you and Melt put on being gentle and just starting where you're at and assessments, those are the three things that I really think make MELT super successful, it, clearly the technique as well. But those three things provide a foundation for us to be able to tap into our body safely, effectively, and lovingly. So we are saying goodbye for today. If you enjoyed this, please go ahead and like us, subscribe, tell your friends. We are getting a lot of great feedback that our content is working for people. And so we appreciate that. If you have any questions for us here at the CPTSD podcast, you can fill out the contact form on our site. That's the best way to make sure that your email is seen. We do want to hear from you, um, thoughts, concerns, interests that you may have, and we will do our best to get to them in time. I'm sure you all understand that we are not going to be workaholics. We're going to model balance for you. Um, we care for you. We hope you're well, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Tabitha. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, thank you, Shelly. Bye, everybody. Bye.